Nicholas Moyer is the president of the Canadian Council for International Cooperation. He is with me now. It's good to see you again. Good to see you Thanks as well. for coming in to speak with me. So the Prime Minister's off to Africa to try and bolster support for mm -hmm. Canada's bid for a temporary seat on the UN Security Council. Uh, that vote in the UN happens in, in June, so it's, it is fast approaching in, in sort of those terms. But what's Justin Trudeau after in Africa? Is it a good idea that he's going? Well, it's a very good idea that he's going. Canada has deep roots in Africa, and it's an important regional bloc when it comes to votes for the Security Council. We're vying against two other countries, Ireland and Norway, that have strong relationships on the continent too, but in many places we have deeper relationships, whether that's through our relationship with the Francophonie and the Commonwealth, but also really individual relationships with, have, with many countries, including two that he's visiting. So, the, some people have suggested, that, look, it, it's a desperation move, that Canada's bid's not going very well. I mean, how, how do you see it? Well, I mean, regardless, it's really important that Canada have a really strong relationship with Africa. And we have historically really had that. If you look uh, of our foreign aid budget, 38% um, of it as of tw 2018 went to that continent. Um, the objective in the government's feminist international assistance policy is for 50% of that budget to be going to Africa. And frankly, in the long run, we need those relationships because that's the economy of the future. That's the continent that's growing fastest. That's where the countries with the fastest growing economies are. Uh, it's hard to separate. Uh, the foreign aid conversation, uh, it, you know, as we speak now, uh, from the UN Security Council. But how, how do you like our chances based on uh, who we're up against? Well, frankly, I, I, it's very hard from the outside to know. And at the end of the day, each country representative of the UN will make their own secret ballot right. vote. And so it's hard to guess. Canada has a lot of goodwill around the world, but we're up against some really impressive competitors. I mean, Norway has been a true and deep partner of countries around the globe, and while they won't have the, the EU's block of votes, mm -hmm. um, they have relationships that are very hard to uh, to compete against. And if you, even just on the uh, international well, why, assistance why is budget. That? What, is, what, what is it Norway's been doing? I mean, that's what, a lot of it comes down to what Norway's yeah. been doing in terms of uh, foreign aid funding, right? I mean, they're, they're in a little bit of a class of their own. At 1% one, one of gross national income compared to Canada, which is 0.3. They really are in a class of their own. And I think they've, they've made big national strategic investments in their foreign policy and foreign engagement, choosing actively to be partners, not always in the most showy and visible ways, but in, in the secret ways that matter in terms of being there for your partners and supporting them in their objectives. You know, if you look on the other, on the other hand, Canada has strong relationships, including on the African continent. But we've also been closing embassies around the world. You know, the African continent, the last 15 years, we've closed four embassies. Mm -hmm. That's as opposed to investing and deepening those relationships. And, and we have really deep brands in, in some of these countries. There's a saying in, in Ethiopia, where I lived for a few years, that um, when there's a drought there, they wish for rain in Canada because it'll, have an, it'll be a benefit right. to them. And, but the thing is that we've been drawing down on that capital over many, many years. Uh, in and successive governments. In successive governments. Right. So, um, so it's hard to know what, what our chances are. And, and, and the other thing to consider, I guess, is that both, uh, I think the, the Norwegian bid and the Irish bid go back almost a, over a decade, right, that they've been planning for this. Mm -hmm. Canada's kind of late to the game. Uh, but does the fact that we're, we're spending um, so little, and I, in relative terms compared to mm -hmm. Ireland, and, and Ireland has got a plan to get to 0.7 of gross national income, and Norway's beyond mm -hmm. that, as we've said. Uh, how much does that hurt us? In a conversation when it comes time to vote, how much do those member countries look at that, and is that a problem for Canada to say, look, you're at 0.3, and you really haven't talked about a plan to, to, to bolster that? I think it, it, it is fundamentally a challenge because when it comes to the numbers, these other two countries can really say we've made strong commitments. You know, you can see our, our action follows our words. But Canada's also been a really constructive actor on the international scene. And certainly we're seen as champions, whether we agree with the, you know, this prime minister's brand or not, um, we're seen as uh, defenders of liberal democracy, of human rights, of gender equality, and that is really valued as well. So it's not just a factor of our, of our ODA commitments, but we don't compare well. And historically, there's a very strong correlation between investments in foreign aid and uh, likelihood of getting that Security Council seat. Mm. Let me ask you about uh, the argument you know, the, let, let's let's for the moment separate uh, the bid for a Security Council seat from the broader conversation about the value of of boosting foreign aid spending. And mm -hmm. we, like last time you and I talked, was during the election campaign. Mm -hmm. The Conservatives had come out with a proposal to cut it by 25 percent. Uh, we had a conversation then. But beyond a bid for a Security Council seat, what, you know, what, what is the lasting value uh, that a country gets from from boosting foreign aid? 
there are huge benefits. You know, we all need to invest in our future. Canada prospers when the world does well. And it's really interesting to look at those arguments. Obviously, there's a moral argument. It's the one we often hear of doing the right thing. But actually, there's a really strong economic argument around investing in partners that will become uh, trading partners in the future. That's true of South Korea, as it is with Bangladesh or Vietnam, where there were wars and we invested in those countries through ODA. And they're now important trading partners of ours. Today, we're dealing with the coronavirus globally. Mm -hmm. I mean, strong global health systems are about protecting us and some of the countries in the world if, if this were to have happened in Africa it would have exploded a lot faster we have to be conscious that there are elements of our national interest in investing in the partnerships that will get us the Security Council seat in the long-term futures of the trade that will come in these economies our security you know there are clear links between poverty around the world and extremism and terrorism I mean there are a lot of important arguments that one needs to look at and don't we feel a little bit more lonely in the world today than we did maybe five or ten years ago when it's really hard for us to secure the the freedom of our Canadians that are in Chinese prisons or when the US we see so clearly our dependency on that trade relationship with the US uh, how much uh, let's finish on this the is it uh, do you think the the government's done enough to to make the case for why it wants a seat at the UN Security Council has there been enough said about what value Canada can bring to that that's a very interesting question because I, I'm not actually fully certain of that case myself. I think there's a lot of benefit to ha us having a voice at that table, um, but that case certainly can be communicated very strongly in terms of the world needs uh, a temperate voice that, uh, that is like Canada's, and we need it at the Security Council seat. I certainly strongly support that bid myself, but has that message been heard by others? I, I think time will tell. Mm. And, and as you said earlier, if a lot of it comes down to, uh, you know, put your money where your mouth is, like show me what you're actually investing in, and it comes back to the, because you're, you're comparing competing bids, right? You uh, are. And, and you look at what Norway's doing, you look at what Ireland's doing, you see Canada's funding envelope down here, and that must raise doubts. It does feel like we're coming late to the game. Partly because of that, because you look at sort of the, the pitches being made by these two other countries and their, their long-term plays in terms of investments and relationships that they've been building. You know, can we point to the same things? Uh, it's not so clear that we can. You know, I think some people do see this as potentially a long shot for us. Um, you know, how important is it? There are some that would argue that, you know, a, a seat on the Security Council is not a real objective in and of itself that it also will expose us to challenges and being stuck between, for example, allies' interests and, you know, the right thing to do. Right. But, but, but does, the, does not winning a seat on the Security Council damage that message we heard when this government was elected that Canada's back? Are we still back if we don't have a seat on the... Or are we back at all? I mean, Look, I'm going to... I mean, I really think that's a good question. I think that Canada's been a very constructive voice globally but we really have a challenge about connecting action to words because even the ambition in the feminist international assistance policy, widely relieved, re, uh, sorry, well received by the partners that have been involved in feeding into that and the gender equality message and the human rights focus, but it needs resources to be implemented. And the reality is that we're not, we're not at all investing to the tune of the ambition that we're sharing. So there's a dissonance there. And I think those that are supportive of the government's vision just really want to see that investment. We don't have to be stuck on a percentage, right. but we need to see more. And we need to be doing our fair share. I mean, we're not doing our fair share. Uh, and so that raises a lot of questions when you're looking at sort of G7 comparators or OECD comparators. We're not at the front of the pack. We're not even average. We're behind average. And I, I think that irks Canadians a little bit. You know, we, we, we want to do our fair share. All right. Lots to consider in uh, your comments. Always good to talk to you. Thanks for being here. It's a pleasure. Thank you.